got it. I got hey, it. I got so I got somebody down here. Get the gun. Get the gun. Hey, can you hear me? Active shooter. Reports of an active shooter. Active shooter. Active shooter of mass casualty incidents. Active shooter. Reports of an active shooter. Active shooter. Active shooter of mass casualty incidents. Employees were discovered hiding inside trains, rail cars, and even inside various parts of rail cars. They were petrified and shaking as they were escorted away to safety. Because the shooting occurred during shift change, there were over 100 people inside the facility, and many ran for their lives once the shooting started. Overwhelming feeling of helplessness and hopelessness as I was listening to my coworkers get gunned down. Inside Building B, a meeting for the power crew was taking place, leaving so many vulnerable to this madman, when he chose to unleash his horrifying act of murder. It seems that some employees were deliberately targeted, while others were purposely spared, for one witness explained later that the shooter told one employee, quote, I'm not going to shoot you, and he let the employee flee before starting to shoot. The Santa Clara Police Department had an impressive response time, about one minute. The department has an office about a block away from the rail yard, making it possible to arrive so quickly and likely save countless lives. The entire shooting lasted about 13 minutes and was over by 6.43 a.m. Several victims were already deceased and laying on the ground. One of my coworkers was still breathing, but he, he, was, he was gone. He was, he was there was nothing we could do for him. Upon the first police officer's arrival, paramedic firefighters, each suited up with a hard helmet and bulletproof vest, raced into Building B, where they found five deceased victims. The investigation into the shooting was immediately underway, and it didn't take long for police to connect the fire at Harry's house to the shooting. The home was completely totaled from the fire, and the second floor collapsed because of the heat from the flames. It took over an hour to extinguish the raging fire. No, I didn't see him this morning. I saw the fire this morning about 6.40. And uh, my wife told me, that, look at outside, there are big fires outside. So I looked at outside, so already got fires. So uh, I walked outside and already big smoking already. So I didn't see him, he leave. I have a security camera to see it. He, I, uh, someone told me that he left over 5.45. This morning. It took over an hour to extinguish the raging inferno. At 7.12 a.m., police informed the public closest to the facility to stay clear of the immediate vicinity. By 8.08 a.m., the sheriff's department confirmed on the local radio that the shooter was stopped, dead in fact, and the scene was contained. There were a total of 39 rounds fired from three semi-automatic handguns that were configured for 32 high-capacity magazines, some with 12 rounds and some with 15. 11 of the 32 magazines were located on Harry's ammo belt. Law enforcement brought about 40 people to safety from various places around the rail yard. Some witnesses reported to police that they believed there may be explosives inside the building, so a bomb squad was brought in to investigate further. Bomb-making items and detonator cords were located in Harry's locker, though later investigation determined that the materials were not dangerous. ATF and FBI agents both responded to the shooting scene. After the initial shock, and perhaps due to the overwhelming nature of the crime and amount of evidence, the FBI ultimately headed up the investigation. The search of Harry's house took a full three days to complete, and several items of evidentiary value were removed, including multiple gas cans, 25,000 rounds of ammunition, about 12 Molotov cocktails, 12 guns, and something described as a, quote, suspicious device. It appeared the uh, Molotov cocktails, which are incendiary devices, uh, were, were in a state where they were ready to use. The three guns used in the shooting were, as most are, obtained through the proper legal channels. It seems Harry planned this attack 
insomuch that he was found to have researched and read up on manifestos and terrorism. A full-scale, room-by-room search was conducted at the entire facility, with bomb-sniffing dogs, and all trains were prevented from entering the gates of the yard. There were no cameras inside of buildings A or B, yet the body cam footage from those police officers remains memorialized in time as a show of the bravery they wear, like a superhero's cape, each time they willingly respond to an incident such as this, never knowing if they will return or not. A reunification center was established at the local county administrative building, where witnesses and the uninjured were brought for statements and to be released to worried family members and loved ones. Three victims died in Building A, and six in Building B. Two of the victims were rushed to the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, where they were each listed as critical, though this seems to be a possible miswording, as one was declared dead on arrival, and the other victim passed away later that day. The victims' ages ranged from 29 to 63 years old, and their jobs at the rail yard included mechanics, linemen, bus and light rail operators, and an assistant superintendent. Many workers were warned of the shots fired and were able to barricade themselves in various offices, while others managed to evacuate completely. Six of the victims were members of Harry's own morning crew, It should be noted that VTA is a gun-free zone, a mandatory rule that Harry recklessly ignored in the name of carrying out his hideous plan to kill. 63-year-old Abdulvaha Balagmandan, also known as Abdi, was a substation manager at the VTA and had been employed there for about 20 years. A husband and proud father of two sons, Abdi was a benevolent man who deeply cared for those around him. He was quick to volunteer for overtime and did not stop working throughout the COVID pandemic. Known as a man who could repair or fix anything, Abdi had a knack for solving puzzles, which he loved to put together after family dinners. He immigrated with his wife and sons from Tehran, Iran, to the United States in the 1990s and was a real role model for his children. Abdi's greatest joy was spending time with his family, and they will miss him immensely. Adrian Beleza was 29 years old when he was killed on the job, where he had worked for about seven years. He worked in maintenance and as a light rail operator. A football guy, he was a huge fan, and even played in high school, and was the captain of the team. Adrian's brother also worked at the VTA, but was not working at the time of the shooting. During the shooting, Adrian and a co-worker, Paul McGee, rushed into a hallway in an effort to stop the shooter from getting into a room with many people hiding inside. Both men died as a result, but they were heroes, sacrificing their lives for their fellow workers. It was the kind of thing most would say Adrian would do. He was a community man and loved his family and essentially all other human life. He leaves behind a wife, young son, and family and friends who will miss him tremendously. Alex Ward Fritch was the last shooting victim to pass away, which was at the local hospital hours after the shooting. In this sense, Alex was at least able to have his family present to say one last goodbye. His wife, his whole world for 20 years, was everything to Alex, as were his kids, including a 30-year-old daughter and two teenage sons. Alex was the family's foundation, and they are devastated without him. He and his wife intended to renew their wedding vows that upcoming September, and it would have been the most joyous occasion for the 49-year-old and his beloved family. Alex worked at VTA for nine years, and was a valued employee. A GoFundMe was set up in Alex's name, and it raised nearly $92,000 in his honor, which is a testament to how much everyone cared for and will mourn Alex. 35-year-old Jose Hernandez III was a substation maintainer with VTA since 2012 and was described as a master mechanic that could fix nearly anything. Jose was a loving father, son, and brother, and was loved very much. Loved ones say Jose had a need for speed and loved riding his motorcycle and boat. Anything he could drive fast, he enjoyed. An extremely hard worker, Jose was incredibly intelligent 
and an esteemed employee at VTA. He will be missed, and his family's loss is immeasurable. 63-year-old Lars Kepler Lane was employed at VTA since 2001 and died there three days before his 64th birthday. Friends and loved ones called him Kep, or Kepi, and he was known to wear a perpetual smile and was always upbeat. He loved doing backyard projects and teaching his grandkids how to build and create things from hand. A man with an extraordinary sense of humor, Lars leaves behind four children and four grandchildren who will never forget the happy man they loved so dearly. Paul de la Cruz Maguia was with co-worker Adrian when he was killed, trying to stop the shooter. He was a courageous man who gave his life to save others. Paul started working at VTA in 2002 and was most recently employed as an assistant superintendent. Known as someone who went above and beyond, Paul loved his family and is survived by his parents, two sisters, wife, and three children. His dad was his best friend, and that pretty much sums up the kind-hearted father, son, husband, and friend that he was. Paul's father was a firefighter and was actually a part of the team that put out the fire at the shooter's house. Paul will be keenly missed by his family, friends, and co-workers. 49-year-old Timothy Michael Romo was a power foreman and overhead line worker who was employed at VTA for 22 years. Timothy was an Air Force veteran who grew up in Greenfield, California, where his father was the police chief and even the mayor for a time. An exceptional father and son, Timothy is survived by his wife and three children, who will never get over the loss of this incredible force, who was taken from them much too soon. Michael Joseph Rudimetkin was employed with VTA since 2013 and was most recently a technician. People always said Michael went out of his way to be kind to others, a quality that never goes unnoticed. His folks say he was passionate about his job and would even come home to do home improvement projects. But he didn't mind. In fact, he rather enjoyed it. Michael loved to play golf, and those who knew him were very aware of his unconditional love for his dogs Olive and Sasha. However, it was his wife, parents, and sister who were his greatest loves. Forty-year-old Michael had a remarkable smile and loved to help others, and he will be missed deeply by all who knew him. 36-year-old Tapjadeep Singh also died a true hero after he placed his own safety aside and risked his life to warn others of the danger that raged inside Building B. Tapjadeep began working at VTA as a bus operator trainee in 2014 and was a respected and valued employee. Born in Punjab, India, he was 17 years old when he immigrated to America with his parents. He loved outdoor sports, including cricket and volleyball, but mostly loved helping others, and did so frequently. Top J.D. is survived by his wife and two children, ages three and one. The loss of the gentle hero who was killed before his time will be felt forever. Active shooter. Reports of an active shooter. Active shooter. Active shooter. Active shooter. Mass casualty incidents. Active shooter. Reports of an active shooter. Active shooter. Active shooter. Active shooter. Mass casualty incidents. Harry was hired at VTA in 2001 as an electromechanic, which is a job he did for the first two years of employment. In 2014, he was promoted to a substation maintainer position. Harry was married for about 10 years, though the couple divorced in 2005. His ex-wife describes Harry as an angry, aggressive man, and frequently became upset with his co-workers at the VTA because he believed work assignments were disproportionately dispersed which seems to be seriously misdirected anger. But nonetheless, Harry felt his co-workers were to blame for these perceived slights. Harry's ex-wife further indicated that he had previously threatened to kill people at the facility on more than one occasion in the ten years leading up to the shooting. Although, much like so many other cases we have covered, she never actually thought he would do it. Despite his belief that co-workers were making his life difficult, Harry's behavior at work was often deemed unacceptable, 
and this led to at least four separate occasions.